DC versus Marvel, Coke versus Pepsi, Xbox versus PlayStation, Mac versus PC, McDonald's versus Burger King, Sir Isaac Newton versus Gottfried Leibniz. Communities can get pretty fiercely territorial over their allegiances, and composers and producers are no exceptions. So I'm going to settle the debate once and for all today. What is the best DAW? Plus, we're going to listen to a lo-fi track produced by a member of the 52 Q's community on this week's episode of the 52 Q's podcast. What is happening, everybody? This is Dave Croft, and welcome back to another episode of the 52 Q's podcast, a weekly podcast where I discuss industry topics and we take a listen to a Q written by a member of the 52 Q's community. And today we are going to be listening to Alley Lights by Chris, aka Jellybeard Productions. And so you want to be sure to certainly stick around for that. If you want to get right on to the Q breakdown and and the, uh, the feedback, then you can click the timestamps in the description below. Just what is 52 Qs? Well, 52 Qs is a diverse and interactive community of composers and producers devoted to writing better production music through lifelong learning, mutual support, and encouragement to others along their journey. And we focus on writing just one Q per week. So if you haven't already, why don't you join us over at 52Qs.com to be a member. It's free. You can sign up and uh, there are tons of other things to take advantage of as well and uh, more information about 52Qs and the different plans as well as our Patreon at the end of the video. Speaking of, I, I would be remiss if I didn't start out by thanking the friends, family, and patrons of 52Qs. We are completely listener supported. We don't take any, you know, ad revenue. You're not going to hear like an ad for Helix Mattress, uh, Helix Mattress in the middle of the podcast. We are supported by those generous folks over there. So uh, you can uh, check out the information at the end of the video. And there has been no no topic, I think, more lively over at the 52Qs community than this question about the DAW. What DAW is everyone using and why? And we got answers completely across the spectrum. I was so, uh, I don't think I was surprised, but uh, it, I, I was pleased at how everyone jumps in and loves talking DAWs. And what I thought it'd be really fun to do today, I thought it'd be really fun to talk about DAWs and talk about all of the DAWs, or at least the heavy hitters, the, 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 the major players. And we're going to break down four specific, which in my opinion, are, are the, the major players in the digital audio workstation space. And then we'll talk about some honorable mentions, and I'm going to settle, settle the debate once and for all. What is the best DAW? Especially the best DAW for production music, but you're going to have to, you're going to have to wait to find out. But I, I get that question a lot. Which is the best DAW? What DAW, what DAW should I use? What DAW uh, has the best features? What, what DAW is the cheapest? What has the most bang for your buck? Well, getting ahead of myself. I want to talk first about the major players in the DAW space. And the four I want to kind of highlight on the front end are Pro Tools, Logic Pro, Cubase, and Ableton Live. Now, I know, I know you're, you're, you're shaking your fist at your, uh, at your podcast feed or at the YouTube video right now because the DAW that, that you use isn't mentioned. And we will have some honorable mentions, and I'll talk a little bit more about those uh, in just a minute. But I want to unpack each of these. So first, we have Pro Tools. Pro Tools is kind of the, 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 the 800-pound gorilla in the DAW space. It is, a, it is quite literally an industry standard. You go to any studio in the world and you're going to find Pro Tools. It's just there. And, and, I, and, and I don't really know the exact history 
other than once upon a time it was married to hardware. And so uh, and so the company, I, I forget who who owned uh, Pro Tools before uh, before Avid, sold the hardware and you had to use the software to run the hardware. And if I'm getting this wrong, please let me know in the comments below. Pro Tools isn't my jam, and I'll talk about why here in a second. But uh, so 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 Pro Tools and the whole entire Pro Tools system got installed into studios across the world. And because of that, if you went to a professional studio, you would encounter Pro Tools. Just, just kind of the way it was because the desks and everything were so good. And it was uh, not the first kid on the block, but definitely the, the heaviest hitter in, in that space. And so because of that, it is a ubiquitous tool. I, I can't think of any, anybody in the professional space who hasn't on some level had to interface with Pro Tools. I don't use Pro Tools. But I've had to do some productions in Pro Tools because a mixing and mastering engineer needed a Pro Tools session. So I would have to like bounce out all my stems and put them all in, into a Pro Tools session and then give the engineer the session itself. And obviously, you know, at Full Sail, we teach Pro Tools because we teach the industry standard tools and Pro Tools is part of that. And that is a huge advantage that Pro Tools has is just the install base. The, the user base, the knowledge base that exists is far, far and wide for Pro Tools. And it is exceptional. And its entire workflow is, is really based around linear recording and linear, linear audio editing. And that's what it does. And that's what it does exceptionally exceptionally well, which is why you find it in all the recording studios. I know of some producers and composers, uh, film composers, who will do all of their MIDI programming in another DAW and then do their mixing and mastering in Pro Tools, or they'll have Pro Tools running side by side their, their, their programming DAW, whether it's Logic or Cubase or whatever, and Pro Tools is running the actual, like the video syncing and everything else. So Pro Tools isn't going away. I don't think Pro Tools is going away anywhere. But where it excels at audio manipulation and audio recording and, and that workflow, I think is absolutely its biggest weakness, which is for all of the greatness it does for audio, it's super weak in MIDI and MIDI programming and, and just using virtual instrument. I mean, it does it because the truth of the matter is all of these DAWs do all of these things, but certain DAWs have certain strengths. And so it's MIDI programming is, is, in my opinion, of course, these are all my opinions here, and this will spark a debate. I imagine the comments will be lively. But... MIDI programming, mm, it's really, really, really late to the game there. Not to mention, kind of dealing with Avid. Avid is, uh, let's just say that they're, they don't seem to be the most consumer-friendly company. They've made some really strange decisions. Their, uh, their update structure is super slow. And as of the, as of the, 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 the timing of this video... I'm not sure it's completely compatible with the new M1 chip, and that's been out a while. I might be wrong on that. And if it is, that's relatively recent, and it was pretty slow on the uptake, which is why, like at Full Sail, we tell students, don't update your, your, your DAW software, don't do any of those updates, because an OS, an operating system update will come out, and then Pro Tools will break, or Sibelius, which is the notation software that Avid, that Avid uh, produces. It will break. And they're really, really super slow on the uptake there. Not to mention the subscription price can get a little, a little sus. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of expensive. And they have like a whole 7.1 uh, surround sound HD setup, which is like three grand, 2,500 bucks just to 
it's really expensive. And just like I think regular Pro Tools, if to not subscribe is like six hundred dollars. And I believe you have to pay for every update, and that's that's a huge drag. But if you are in the world of audio production, studio recording, then Pro Tools absolutely needs to be on your computer, hundred percent, in my opinion. Which brings me to the the second kind of largest uh, DAW that you're going to see, and that is Logic Pro. Logic Pro is made by Apple, uh, and it has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of things going going right for it. If you are in the Mac ecosystem, then Logic is optimized for the Mac. Logic almost always works for whatever the lating, latest operating system is, and it is one of, if not the fastest DAW currently, as of this as of this recording, that runs on the new. Uh, silicon chips, the M1 chips, and Logic is a beast, as it should be, because the software is made by the hardware manufacturer. And if those, if you can't get that right, then you're something's broken somewhere along the way. So, uh, Logic just works. Relatively low barrier of entry. It's uh, it's three hundred dollars for lifetime updates. Now, I don't think they actually say lifetime updates, right? I think they kind of hedge their bets, but I've been in Logic since Logic 9 for 10 years and I've never paid for an update. And they keep adding features. Like Logic 9 to Logic 10 was like getting a whole new DAW. And pretty frequent updates. I think their 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 updates they they don't they, they seem a little slow on the uptake for some tools that seem to be uh, or some features that seem to be pretty standard on other DAWs, but uh, I think, and I want to believe that they do that in the name of stability, because like logic just works and it's very stable, very infrequent crashes. And if I do run into a crash, it's usually because I've overloaded my system. Like there's a, I've, you know, I'm on a 2014 iMac still kicking around. Right, and uh, and uh, logic really only crashes when I try to do too many things at once, and the CPU spikes, and then it'll kind of hang up. Not to mention, logic has a huge library of sounds, seventy-two gigabytes of sounds, with top-notch plugins. Uh, just the compressor alone, the EQ is fantastic. You can do anything, anything you need to do from a production standpoint using the stock Logic tools. Now, there are absolutely other tools, other sounds, which are better than the stock Logic sounds and stock Logic plugins like EQ and the compressors and, and all that. But you don't need to. It's got a huge stable of sounds and plugins. And there are some, some stock sounds that I use even though I have access to all of these other sounds. The marimba is my go-to marimba. Anytime I need to dust off my Thomas Newman vibe, I dial up the Logic marimba. The Logic harp is fantastic. The Logic dulcimer is absolutely fantastic. The Logic compressor, I still use it. I have like the gold or platinum or diamond, whatever of the waves bundle. I have those. I have all of the the complete ultimate collector's edition. This time it's personal, whatever the the uh, the, the ultimate edition of complete is. I have all these plugins, but I keep dipping back into stock logic. They're very very lightweight, and they just they just work out of the box. Where, which brings me to one of Logic's biggest, if not the biggest, con which is it's Mac only. It's Mac only. That, that, is, that is one of its biggest cons, is if you're not in the Mac uh, ecosystem, and, and, and Macintoshes are not cheap. Apple products aren't cheap. But I can also tell you, you know, I'm on a 2014 iMac, which I, I, I bought early 2015, and I literally like maxed it out. Whatever the maximum RAM is, the maximum processor, GPU, 
And here it is, 2022, and I'm still using it professionally. I, I would love to see a PC from 2014, especially a unibody type PC, like I have with the 5K display and everything. And it's not without its issues. I still have some like some ghosting issues uh, on my dis display. It's an eight-year-old display. It, it's going to happen, but I, I don't think a PC would, would, would have stuck around quite so long. The other thing is, is, is that um, some of the uh, logic's really good at a lot of things, but some things it's not really great at. Uh, I, and I have found like automation, like precision automation. I, I got deep into uh, writing a, a dubstep track <laughs> back when dubstep was much more of a thing. And I had meticulously like done, uh, done modulation automation to open up a, a filter to create a wobble base. And this was uh, especially before a lot of the plugins came out that did a lot of this for you. And uh, it just, it, it, I, I saved it, came back to the session the next day, reopened it, and my automation had just kind of slid around a little bit. And so I had rhythmically and meticulously programmed all of those. And uh, it was just messed up. I don't know why it got hosed, but it was. And so that was a real, um, that, that was a real drag. And, and, and like I said, another, another thing is some features that other, that other DAWs do and, and have done for a while are pretty slow to the, to the, uh, to the draw for logic. For example, like stereo sends, and, and and panable sends and, and things like that. I have a buddy of mine who is just infuriated about the lack of of uh, stereo sends uh, and 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 panable sends and aux buses and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and so so logic that is Logic Pro. I'd say that if you are looking for if you're on the Mac and you're looking for the Swiss Army knife. The this thing is the last doll you will need because it does pretty much everything pretty well. Then I think Logic is your call, especially if you're on like one of the new M1 chips, because Logic is is an absolute beast. As is also like Final Cut, which is the the nonlinear video editing software. So, so those are really kind of the two heaviest players in the DAW space. Now let's talk about two of the, the other heavy hitters. And the next one is Cubase. Now, full disclosure, I don't own Cubase. I've never run Cubase, but this is based off of observation and seeing a lot of discussion over and over, uh, not to mention the big, heavy Hollywood composers. They, many of them, use Cubase. Because what Cubase really excels at is MIDI programming, editing, editing, and delivering stems uh, and other alt mixes and, and, and output, outputting waves, AFs for delivery. Its workflow, it's from my understanding, is geared towards those type of professional deliverables. And I know composers who swear by Cubase. And I think, didn't they just come out with like version 12, I believe? So version 12 of Cubase. I don't think it's crazy expensive. And um, I know a lot of, like I said, a lot of the, the Hollywood heavy hitters, the film composing world is deep into Cubase. But some of the cons is that it has kind of an older uh, UI Whereas, uh, like, like Logic looks very, very kind of touchable, and we're, we'll talk about Ableton here in a minute. And it's very kind of modern, slick, customizable works workspace where you can change the colors. Whereas Cubase seems a little older, and some of the the workflow can be a little challenging coming from another DAW. Every discussion post I've, I've seen, and the one over at 52 Qs is no exception, everybody says, who, everybody who loves Cubase says, I love Cubase after I got my brain around it. 
once I figured out the workflow. It took me two weeks. It took me a month. After two months, now I'm, I'm, I'm all in, which I guess is kind of true of any, any DAW or any software, whether it's you're going from you know, uh, WordPress to Squarespace for, for building websites, or if you're going from you know, Premiere to Final Cut for, for video editing, the workflow is going to change, but the meat of what the software can do should be the same. But I get the impression that Cubase has a particular workflow that you have to embrace and that you have to be on board for and really stick to it. And so that is Cubase. It's made by Steinberg. And uh, answer, you can let me know in the, uh, in the comments, do you still need a, a, a key, a little Steinberg key for that? I know I have one just because Vienna Symphonic Libraries needed the Steinberg key, but I know that other systems which have required like iLocks, I know that those have moved away from that. Uh, let me know in the comments below if Cubase still requires a key. I think that is a massively antiquated uh, system. And as a matter of fact, I have my I have my Steinberg key right here. This is just a little a little thumb drive that uh, stays plugged in. This has stayed plugged into my keyboard actually, because my keyboard has a, a USB. And then every time I go to open up VSL, then it authenticates it through the 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 little key, the th the, the thumb drive, the dongle. Uh, Pro Tools used to have an iLock, and I think now you can put the iLock license onto onto your computer, which is fantastic because iLocks and thumb drives and all of that business is a massive headache and uh, quite honestly, a deal breaker. If I had, if I had to, to do over again, I probably would not have gotten VSL because I think that th that little thumb drive is kind of a, a pain. It's, it's a pain to, to deal. Uh, but the Steinberg system is head and shoulders beyond iLock. iLock is, yeah. Everybody I know who has to futz with iLocks, they, they, they have some iLock horror stories, and I uh, mine is no exception. And so even though I'm not using Pro Tools, I do have some software which uses the iLock license for it. Thankfully, software manufacturers are embracing the, in, uh, the, uh, the internet of things. And so being able to authenticate users and copyright protection, not through a, a piece of physical hardware that plugs into your system and chews up an USB slot, but uh, through the internet and being able to uh, authenticate digitally, I think is, is far, far superior. So that's, that's Cubase. And so I would say that if you are getting into the heavy film score world and that what you have to deliver is a lot of, you know, various stems and, and versions and you you need flexible MIDI programming where you you could you know program an orchestra, then I think Cubase might be the better option for you. Especially if you're into MIDI programming and you're not on a, a Mac, absolutely get thee to Cubase right now. If you're on a PC and you're a MIDI a virtual instrument composer, Cubase I think is your jam. And then finally, the fourth, the fourth, fourth DAW I want to talk about today, which is so different than all of these other DAWs. Because bef before now, these DAWs have been very much kind of like recreating in a virtual space, a digital space, recreating the experience of using, you know, knobs and, and faders. And, and it, it feels like you're using skeuomorphic versions of hardware. At least the workflow and everything kind of, it's in that mindset, which is why faders still look like physical faders with drop shadows. And, and again, it's called skeuomorphism where uh, user interface elements in a digital realm reflect physical, phys physical objects, skeuomorphism. There was a DAW that came along and turned all of that on its head, and that is Ableton live ableton live originally kind of came out for the edm producer the hip-hop producer and i feel like they kind of threw out the rule book of what a daw should look like and made their own thing 
And so because of that, the UI is very customizable, especially from a color standpoint, and it uses mostly vector artwork, which scales beautifully. I mean, even to this day, there are elements in Logic, there are components in Logic, which are low res. I'm looking at you like Sculpture, ESM and ES2, these, these old plugins that, that look, like, look like they did. 10, 15 years ago when we were all on little tiny monitors. But Ableton came along. It's all vector-based artwork, which scaled beautifully depending on how big and how small it was. It just looked clean. And it tossed out the rule book as far as the skeuomorphic design. And so your faders is just like an arrow on, on, on a bar. Not to mention that, because EDM was one of its primary kind of markets, especially early on, the, the tools it has and the precision that you can achieve using the automation tools in Ableton, in my opinion, is absolutely unparalleled. Not to mention, it still to this day has one of the best time stretching, it calls it warping. Logic calls it flex pitching, the, the ability to, to look at an audio file and set in that audio file like where the beats are and stretch and slow down and having different algorithms it can use depending on you know, what type of sound it is and in different uh, qualities of that. It has the absolute best warping engine and has had for a long time. I mean, it... it I, I believe I jumped into Ableton in Ableton version three. I think they're up to Ableton 11 now. And even version three, the warping engine was top shelf. And I believe it came out of the gate. I think version one had warping to it because it was used for electronic artists and they were taking, uh, they were uh, making remixes and, and all of these other things. And so uh, it's absolutely the best warping engine on the block, hands down, hands down. And I will argue with anybody who says otherwise, even though I'd love to have a discussion, let me know in the comments below. <laughs> but the UI, the, the non-traditional uh, interface, the vector artwork, the fact that everything looks kind of more like parameters than knobs and buttons, for me, was a big ask because I'm just old enough to where I, you know, I, I remember like all of that hardware and, and it's, I mean, it still exists, obviously it hasn't gone away, but I am of the user interface school where I want my buttons and faders to resemble buttons and faders because that's how my brain is connected that, uh, connected those things. And so when I pull up uh, an Ableton live session, I, I quite honestly get overwhelmed by, it just looks like a sea of parameters. And it's really easy to get turned around. Even as beautiful as it is, even as customizable as all the colors and everything are, and even how, as strong as the warping engine is, as strong as, you know, we haven't even talked about, you know, using loop scenes and be able to stack loops. This is why I used Ableton so much, especially when I lived in Memphis, because I did a lot of remixing. I did a lot of live DJing and I used Ableton uh, in live performance where I would fire off loops in the background and they would just cook. And then I would have my loops controlled by a drum pad that I would hit that would change scenes. And so it was insanely powerful. And I still use Ableton Live today for those that purpose. But what I can't do is produce in Ableton because I'm so, again, I'm of a certain age where my brain and my interface internal logic responds to knobs, buttons, and faders that still pretty much look like knobs, buttons, and faders. And so just having, having parameters is overwhelming to me. And it might be overwhelming to you as well. But I still, I still use Ableton 
whenever I make, like uh, I'll record some suspended cymbal samples, I'll bring them into Ableton and do, uh, do some time stretching to them. And so I can take like four different suspended cymbal rolls and generate different lengths because the Ableton engine is so strong. It's so strong. So if you are an EDM producer, if you produce hip hop, especially if you need granular control over automation and your brain is wired such that you don't feel like you need it to look like hardware necessarily, then I think Ableton is, is your jam. They, Ableton does require paid updates and it it's it can be a little kind of confusing. They have like different versions, and and many of these DAWs have light versions or, or free versions or trials. Uh, Logic doesn't have a trial, but it does have GarageBand, which is essentially Logic Light. It's the same audio engine using the same sample library. It's just it's like a light version, and it's like I think it's installed on every Mac. And Ableton Live has a light version as well. If you've bought a, a MIDI controller in the last 10 years, chances are you have a license for Ableton Live Lite. They are relentless, especially if you bought a Novation keyboard. So Ableton Live might be your jam. Might be your jam. Okay, so I hear you. I hear you right now. You're, you're screaming into the wind, what about my DAW? So I wanted, I want to just briefly go over some honorable mentions, some honorable mentions. And I'll start with uh, the DAW that really got me into production, and that is Reason. Formerly from Propeller Heads, now I think it's just Reason Studio. Uh, Reason, I, I love Reason for many of the same reasons that I love Logic, in that there, it, it comes with so many sounds. It's really, really good at MIDI programming, and and uh, it's that skeuomorphic design. In fact, you can kind of flip the the rack, and you can look at the back of of Reason and and do your own wiring. Like literally, click a wire, and a little dangly wire pulls out, and then you can reroute it. This is one of the reasons that I taught Reason for nearly ten years back in Memphis. Because in, in my electronic music production or my digital music composition class, I used I, I wanted to teach students signal flow and workflow, and I needed them to have something that had a ton of sounds and is is absolutely usable from a, a beginner level. And reason fit that bill. Now, the downside is, is that they are still relatively new to uh, recorded audio up until version six, I believe. You, it was just the sounds in the box. You couldn't bring in outside plugins. Outside plugins is a very recent thing, like within the last three to four years. It might be longer. The pandemic has skewed everything. It might be longer than that. But very recently, could you bring in outside AUs and VSTs into Reason? And it wasn't until Reason 6 that you could record audio, which I actually leveraged uh, when, I, when I taught it because it was just, you didn't get into, hey, do I record my own sounds? You didn't get into any outside plugins causing issues or anything. It's just complete turnkey solution. Here's your box of sounds with your DAW. Let's go. But that was also a, a huge, huge downside. The hugest being that you can't, you know, use outside plugins until recently. Thankfully, though, I feel like they've really seen the light, and they now uh, offer Reason as a plugin. So you can buy the entire Reason sounds and plug it into your DAW. And because of that, I am back on the Reason hype train. Because as a DAW, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. It's got really good MIDI uh, MIDI programming, even though it, it works a little bit differently. It, it, it reasons MIDI MIDI programmer reminds me more of Ableton's programming, and I've been in Logic for the last ten years, and so going back to Reason as a MIDI MIDI is is a little challenging. But but uh, as a DAW, it's it's really good. 
Not to mention the mixer licensed the um, the SSL technology. And so their mixing rack looks like an SSL board, which if you're not familiar with that, it's like a world famous uh, mixing console. And like Waves has SSL plugins and you can actually buy, I think, SSL plugins themselves. And so, uh, but they actually licensed the SSL tech and so it looks like an SSL board with the inline compressors and and the uh, the same uh, the same algorithms for the EQs and everything. But I love the fact that Reason is available as a plugin. But my first real kind of DAW, the first time I got into like, hey, I'm making my own things wasn't even if technically it was acid pro but that's a whole other story uh which was fruity loops which is now called fl studio so fl studio if you are a, a hip-hop or an edm producer then fl studio and you, if you don't want to get into ableton because of the price or whatever then fl studio is is your jam especially if you're a hip-hop producer because fl studio bakes into its set of tools, um, tools and techniques that are just custom built for hip hop and EDM production. For example, like creating stutter hats or trap hats. It's just, it's so easy to do. And up until recently, Logic, you know, wasn't able to do it, but, you know, just kind of press a button and then you have instant stutter hats. It's really, really easy, easy to do that. But it is still kind of late late to the party in terms of being a, a legitimate DAW, and I put legitimate, you know, in quotes there. But uh, up until recently, and Reason suffers from this a little bit as well, it was seen as much more of a consumer tool or a prosumer tool and not really a professional tool. However, I think that that line is, is significantly blurred now, significantly more blurred now. And I know that there are producers who do a lot of amazing things in FL Studio formerly Fruity Loops. Next, the free version, or the, the free the free DAW, which I don't think it's technically free. I think it's only like 60 bucks, but there are some absolute diehard Reaper fans out there. It's by uh, Kakos, I think is the name of the company that, that makes Reaper. Uh, Reaper is free. It's, it's actually, I think it kind of is like the old shareware model, a business model. And uh, there are folks who absolutely, they are Reaper, ride or die. I've had a little bit of experience with Reaper uh, because before we got onto Logic at the, the church I was the technical director at, uh, they used Reaper because it was free. And the sound engineer knew Reaper really, really well. And uh, some of the, the advantages of Reaper are the price point. It's a very low barrier of entry, but it also, for that low price point, you're not going to get a ton of plugins. You're going to get very little sounds, uh, but it's also very kind of customizable as, as far as being able to add your own thing to it. Very, very lightweight. It's very, very processor friendly. But you, I think you need to know what you're doing a little bit more with Reaper. If you're brand new to this, then I would not recommend necessarily Reaper because you're not going to be able to just kind of open it, pop in a few sounds, and go to work. Uh, it, it, Reaper feels like the it – kind, it kind of reminds me of if <laughs> like Pro Tools, if Pro Tools was like an open source type of a, type of a DAW. And I don't think Reaper is open source necessarily, but if Pro Tools was made in an open source fashion, then I think you would have like something like Reaper. Next, Studio One by Presonus. Uh, Presonus is a hardware manufacturer. I think they make uh, <laughs> don't they don't they make uh, audio interfaces and all of that. And there are some folks some folks in the the thread over at Fifty Two Qs. Their Studio One. They absolutely love it. I have zero experience with Studio One, but my impression is, is that for the 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 MIDI programmer, the the composer needing to deliver a bunch of types of waves and alt mixes and stems, that Studio One is a good alternative to Cubase. 
So if, if that's you, uh, whether it's Mac or, or PC, and you don't want to get into the Cubase space, then I think Studio One is going to be for you. Again, no experience from me personally, but Studio One might be a good good option for you. And then finally, the, the last the last honorable mention that I want to spend a long time mentioning, <laughs> these honorable mentions were kind of long, and that is Digital Performer by Motu or Mark of the Uni- Unicorn. And uh, in college at Appalachian State, I, I was using Performer when Digital Performer came out, and that was a really, really big deal. And there are some old school, old school composers who grew up kind of uh, their first DAW was Performer which was all about, you know, controlling, it's all MIDI, MIDI instruments and every, it was really, really so much more complicated back then than it is today because you had all these, this MIDI hardware. And so you would need a, a com- computer program software to run all of those MIDI instruments. And then that all gets routed back in. And then you would have to have another tracking uh, software. And it, it got a little, uh, it got a little convoluted. It's why they taught it in academic computer labs. Uh, it's significantly simpler, significantly simpler now. And then Digital Performer came out, kind of revolutionized it. And I think the uh, composers who cut their teeth early on Performer and Digital Performer, they're, they're, they are, they've got their, their, uh, their plot of land, and they might be in the middle of nowhere all by themselves, but they, they swear by it. And I haven't used Digital Performer since my undergrad days, and uh, and I, it's it's not it wasn't for me. It didn't really resonate for me. I do like Motu. I used uh, uh, Mark of the Unicorns uh, Mosaic Composer Mosaic back when it was. Is it even still a thing? Now it's all Finale and Sibelius, but it's a notation software, and I loved I loved Mosaic, but but I haven't used Digital Performer in years, in years, in years. So there are other DAWs floating around out there, even even beyond the, the exhaustive list that we talked about today. But I wanted to end this segment by answering, okay, all right, Dave, you've talked a lot about the different DAWs and what they're good at and what they're bad at. What's, what's the best DAW? What is the best DAW for music production, and here it is. The best DAW is the DAW that you know. Sorry if that was a letdown. (laughs) The best DAW is the one that you know. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's not about the tool. It's not about the tool. It's about what you can do with the tool. You give a toy piano to John Baptiste, and he's still going to sound amazing. You give a, a student instrument, you know, you give a, a, a student cello to Yo-Yo Ma, and it's still going to sound like Yo-Yo Ma, because it's not the tool. And don't we get stuck, and don't we get into the mindset that if only I had this DAW, if only I had this plugin, then I would finally be able to make the music that I want to make. And guys, I am, I'm with you. I'm, I'm with you. I get my wanderlust every now and then where I'm like, the grass is greener over there. You know, especially being in these forums and, and hearing people go on and on about Cubase or, or on and on about Ableton. And I'll like load it up and I just, I don't know it. And so all of those things get in the way of my productivity and my creativity because I don't know that tool. And so the the best DAW is going to be different for different people for a couple of different reasons. Because our brains are wired differently, we learn differently, and we all have different goals and experiences. And so if, for, for me, I like the touchy-feely, gooey uh, skeuomorphism, that might not be a, a, an, an intellectual cognitive requirement for you. 
But for me, it kind of is, which makes Ableton kind of a deal breaker in the production space. I am on a Mac, and so Logic is the ultimate choice for me. It's the obvious choice for me. But that doesn't make it the right choice. It's just a right choice for me. And so whatever DAW that you are resonating with, my encouragement to you would be to stick with it. Don't ping pong around to different DAWs. That would be like saying, I want to make music, so I'm going to learn the trumpet. And then learning the trumpet, and you're like, uh, now I'm going to learn saxophone. Well, that's all right. They all play the same 12 notes in a chromatic scale, but they all play it differently. Now I'm going to play piano. Oh, now I'm going to learn marimba. Now flute. And you're not allowing yourself enough time to really learn the instrument. Because at the end of the day, the DAW is, is an instrument. That's how I see it. I'm making music using an instrument. And I'm going to practice that instrument the same way I would practice a flute. I'm going to have my ups and downs. Some things are going to come easier. Some things are going to be challenging. Some days I'm not going to want to sit there and make music. Some days I'm going to look up and, the, and eight hours have gone by. You'll have your victories. You'll have your challenges, your mountaintop moments, and your valleys. But whatever doll you're, you're going to go with, and chances are one of these that I've already been talking about has kind of like resonated with you on some level. And I would encourage you to go with that one and really stick with it and honestly stick with it and be honest with yourself. Give it two months. That's why all those Cubase guys are like, yeah, after two months, I'm, I'm, I'm ride or die Cubase. But the best DAW is the one that you know. What about you? I would love to hear from you. Please let me know in the comments below what DAW has worked for you and why. Let's keep it civil. And luckily, I, I don't think anybody gets quite as fierce. You know, this isn't like kind of like Duke versus UNC kind of rivalry uh, or Mac and PC or man, go to game forums. Woo. Look at like League of Legends versus World of Warcraft. Those guys are brutal. But uh but I would love to hear from you in the comments below. Let me know what DAW is working and why. Let's talk about it. So with all of that having been said, let's change gears and we are going to listen to Stream Alley Lights. This is by Jellybeard, AKA Chris from the 52Qs community. We're gonna take a listen to it and talk about it on the other side. <laughs>
All right, that was Alley Lights. And I know, and, and Chris mentioned that this is a work in progress. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we could have ended, uh, I'm not sure if these were kind of sketches here at the end, but I think we could, could have totally ended with that hit right there because that's at around two minutes and 24 seconds. And I think we, we absolutely could have kind of faded faded that out and hit it. Give it give it a nice button and go from there. But uh, Chris, thank you so much for sending this along. I really, really enjoyed, really enjoyed this. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this cue today is to talk about lo-fi because I feel like lo-fi is, and it's been kind of going on for the last couple of years, this emergent style, which is starting to find its way into, you know, briefs from libraries looking for lo-fi tracks. And it's really interesting because it's, you know, it's it's a, a subset of, of of electronic music as well as hip hop. There's an intrinsic hip, hip hop kind of quality to it. But uh, lo-fi is used often for like, for, for like, you, you'll see it in concentration playlists, which is why I think one of the most popular YouTube channels is a live stream of nothing but like lo-fi music for 24 hours a day. And because of that, one of the things that makes lo-fi really, really work is the repetitive nature of lo-fi and how it's just almost, it's just kind of uh, very loopy and, and, Repetitive, for lack of a better term, or another term. So uh, the challenge for us as production music composers is how do we, how do we remain remain authentic to lo-fi and yet still make things kind of usable for the production music editor? Imagining how this is kind of going to get used in a TV show or a commercial or something like that. So my recommendation for you would be to smooth out your song sections a little bit. And because we had some kind of four bar phrases every now and then, and like some two bar ideas and a three bar ideas. And as a lo-fi track released by an artist, I think that absolutely would work because, you know, it's your art and you're going to do that and that's totally okay. But from a production music standpoint, I feel like we need to, to make these phrases a little bit more predictable. Just so, just so it's not going to pull focus. And anytime, you know, in, anytime we have something which breaks out of out of the ordinary, whether it's a, a time signature or whether it's phrasing or whether it's a melody kind of popping out or something like that, then we run the risk of it interfering with dialogue or interfering with a scene existing on on the screen. Oh, by the way, quick note. Let's. The, the 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 pitch of your kick mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, and it's this is one of the things that's a real challenge for you know hip hop producers and EDM producers using kick samples and kick sounds that that have an inherent pitch to them see also 808s uh, you you have to consider how it interacts with the harmonic structure because as you are listening to it it gets it gets kind of swept up into the chord qualities if that makes any sense so you'd want to make sure that it it doesn't have to it doesn't have to match right it's not an 808 where it has to be necessarily a bass sound but i would pitch that just a little bit so it settles into the mix a little bit better mm. And so for me, it's for, for me, it's clashing just a little bit. And also, the mix seems a little sibilant, really kind of crisp. And some some of the textures kind of popped out, and you can actually see the waveform here. How uh, some of, some of these elements, and I know this is a SoundCloud waveform, but some of the elements are, are popping out just a little bit. Uh, and, and another question when you're kind of production musicizing lo-fi is, you know, how 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 faithful do you want to be to having edit points and those types of things? And we do have a little bit of an edit point type of a thing going on around a minute thirty. Nice. Yep. 
think a little riser, a little shaw, something kind of coming out of that could have been a nice touch. And so in addition to, uh, in addition to the phrasing and kind of smoothing out and regulating your phrasing, I felt like there might have been one or two, two, one or two too many ideas. Like I liked boop, 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 that little, kind of like that little little melody idea. What? what? Trying trying to find what I what I was hearing. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what I was hearing. Never, never mind. Never mind what I just said. And then, again, staying true to hip hop, uh, trip hop, or lo-fi, but still in the production music. I feel like we could have added a little bit more energy, just so it's building and progressing in energy as it goes on throughout the queue. Now you mentioned uh, wanting to add vocals. I don't, I don't necessarily think you, you, you need vocals on this. So especially with the vocal chops and everything. I, th I, think it, I think it's absolutely working on its own. But love the vibe in this. The other uh, and final consideration and this is to all of you folks out there uh, making lo-fi, is one of the, uh, the components of lo-fi in the drum groove is to make them sound like they're not quite in time, you know, where it's, it, it's like, a, and, I, and I watched a tutorial on it, and he made a 15 and a half beat pattern. Right, so he made a 15 and a half beat pattern using, so technically it was in 1516, right? And then he took the audio file and stretched it to 4-4. Four, four. So the audio file, even though it was a bar of 15-16, he stretched it to full, you know, 4-4. Four, four. And then that created this kind of unease, this almost like a record skipping type of a vibe, which I know is intrinsic into lo-fi as a style. But as a production music composer... I would say tread lightly because you don't want it to sound like an error. And you're not doing this at all. It's just like I said, I, I wanted to talk lo-fi today uh, because I see that happening. And, and, and writing in 1516 and stretching that to 4-4, that's a really interesting way to, to solve that problem. Uh, but it... It made my, uh, as a drummer, I have a thing called in the internal phrase clock. It's what I teach my students. Uh, whereas you're, you're, you're always kind of ticking off measures in your head as you're playing. And it, it made my internal phrase clock go haywire. And, and just, it, it was, it, it felt uneasy. I did not, I did not enjoy listening to a bar of 15, 16 stretched over uh, a complete bar of 4-4 four, four because it was, it, it felt like a record skipping, which is great. And you need it, need that kind of vibe for uh, lo-fi, but uh, I imagine that that might throw up some issues for for a publisher. Thank you so much, Chris, for submitting your cue. Uh, we're going to have a link to Chris's SoundCloud in the description below, and this was part of the thread for uh, for week fourteen here at Fifty Two Cues. Every week. We put a call out for submissions, and you can post your cue and get feedback. I would love to have you. We would all love to have you over at 52 Cues. Like I said, we are a community of composers looking to help each other out. And to join the community, it's free. To join the community, post your cues, get feedback on your cues, and learn from the community. But we do have other options and other tiers available to you, starting at just $14 a month, you get access to the music production live streams, and you get the access to our monthly workshops. And just earlier this week, just this past Monday, we did a, nearly a two-hour workshop where I broke down step-by-step 
my mixing and mastering process. Coming up next week, we have the one and only Canadian's friendliest composer, Marlon Gibbons, is giving a workshop on survival kit for composers. And we've got lots of other workshops coming along. And if you are looking for even more feedback, feedback like I like I just gave Chris, we have another tier for $39 a month and you get access to the Zoom critique and feedback sessions where we all get in a room and we listen to each other's cues and I provide uh, clinical feedback uh, on the cues. I bring them into the DAW, bring them into Logic. We, we check out the loudness. We look at the mix, form, titles, the whole works. And uh, if you subscribe to that family level, then you get access to that every single week. And so lots more information about all of those different levels at 52Qs.com. We would absolutely love to have you. If you just want to join the live streams that I do every single Thursday afternoon, then you can check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash Dave Croft to join the Patreon. It's just $1 a month and you help keep things like this channel, live streams, 52Qs. You keep all of that happening because, uh, because you didn't have to sit through, you know, a, a commercial for HelloFresh. <laughs> but uh, for for Chris, thanks again for sending along your cue, and uh, I want to give uh, a, a shout out to everybody over at Fifty Two Cues who have already jumped in and made uh, the first few weeks of the launch of that a roaring success. But I hope that you it had a really good week 14 and uh, we are uh, in the middle of week 15, wrapping that up. I'm gonna be talking about that next week, but that's gonna do it for me. Thank you so much for joining me and I hope to see you next time. Until then, peace. The 52 Cues podcast is copyright 2022, Dave Croft, all rights reserved. The music played on the podcast is copyright of their respective owners and is used for educational purposes only. For more information, including joining the 52 Cues community and submitting your cue for consideration on the podcast, head over to 52Cues.com. <laughs>